Hey everyone, this is Tammy Painter, and you're listening to the Book Owl Podcast, the podcast where I entertain your inner book nerd with tales of quirky books and literary lore. So it's cold, it's wet, it's windy, and you're in a tiny boat after fleeing from your peaceful island home that's just been invaded by one of the most feared groups of the ages. There's no cover in this boat, and you can only hope it doesn't capsize. And worst of all, you're in charge of making sure a precious book makes it safely to where it needs to go. A book in which one page alone would have taken weeks to produce. So, boats, books, icky weather, clearly we're preparing to celebrate St. Patrick's Day on the podcast. Okay, so your St. Patrick's Day festivities might be more beer-oriented than book-oriented, but I figured the day that celebrates Ireland's most famous saint would also be the perfect day to tell you all about Ireland's most famous library and the most famous book within that library. And yes, with St. Patrick's Day still six days away when this episode comes out, I'm a little early with this, but that's just the way things worked out. And hey, you can always listen to it again on the 17th. But before we step through the doors of Trinity College Library to get a peek at the Book of Kells, I just want to offer one quick thank you to everyone who purchased my darkly humorous paranormal mystery tale, The Undead Mr. Tenpenny, since it launched a couple weeks ago. You put a big smile on my face, and you also gave me a nice little boost in the Amazon ranking system for a few days. And of course, if you didn't get your copy yet, it's never too late to pop into that link in the show notes. Oh, and if you did get a copy and you have read it, please be sure to leave a review on BookBub or Goodreads or wherever you bought it. Okay, thank you. All right, so I initially had planned to make this a two-part celebration with one episode being dedicated to the Trinity College Library and another episode dedicated to the Book of Kells. But there just wasn't a whole lot of information on the library itself, which I found really odd because the thing is like 400, 500 years old. So what I'm going to do instead is blend the two histories of these topics until they come together in a nice little bookish mesh. Well, that's the plan anyway. Oh, and one more thing before we start. I know, long intro, sorry. Over on Instagram, I'm not only celebrating all things Irish, but I'm also coping with being unable to travel by sharing pictures from my trips to Ireland every day in March. So if you're on Instagram, be sure to follow along. Okay, can we start this damn episode already? Now, for those of you who don't know, the Book of Kells is an illuminated manuscript, and no, that doesn't mean it comes with a nightlight. Illuminated in this case means decorated with drawings or dolled up with fancy capitals. These were typically religious texts and would have been created on calf vellum by scribes literally working their fingers to the bone. And for the numbers people out there, the Book of Kells itself measures 33 centimeters tall by 25 centimeters wide, or 13 inches by 10 inches. And inside, there's currently 680 pages of illustrations that include some Christian symbols, but also Celtic animals and knots and elaborate interlaced borders. Oh yeah, and there's text too which consists of the four Gospels as well as some other religious essays. Researchers figured out that the Book of Kells was created sometime in the late 800s to maybe the early 900s. And the research has also shown that based on the handwriting and the style of the images, that the book was likely filled in by three artists and four scribes. And from analysis done on the images and the text, they would have been using pigments such as red and yellow ochre, oak gall for the black, woad and indigo for the purple. But they were also probably using lead and arsenic. So, you know, maybe not so much a long-term career being a scribe. But on to the history. And for that, we have to go back even further to the 500s. So, in 521 Common Era, a guy is born to the Royal Neal family of Ireland. A few years later, he's grown into a bit of a troublemaker, so he takes a copy of the Gospels. The church asks for it back, he refuses, and a big old battle ensues. Now, the Neal family didn't gain power by being friendly and altruistic. They were warriors. 
and as such, they won the battle and a lot of people died. The guy, he feels bad for so many people dying for his foolishness, so he undergoes a form of self-penance and leaves Ireland behind. He eventually ends up on the island of Iona off the coast of Scotland, where he founds an abbey. And this guy becomes known as St. Columkill, or St. Columba if you want to anglicize things. And for as tiny as this island is, it's Iona itself is barely three miles long by a mile wide. It becomes a huge religious center. St. Columkill becomes super important, and Iona becomes a site of pilgrimage, as well as a burial place for over, well, for about 60 kings from Scotland, Ireland, and Norway. And just as a funny side note, Columkill had some strange convictions. See, at the time, there were mixed religious houses, so nuns and monks could share the same residence. And if I remember right, they, I think they could even marry. Well, Columkill was having none of it, and he banned women from Iona. And he wouldn't even allow the wives of the men building his monastery to stay on the island. And while he was at it, he also banned cows. Why cows and women? Because he said wherever there are cows, there are women. And wherever there are women, there is mischief. Which, yeah, is kind of true. Of course, he also banned frogs and snakes from the island, but it is an island uh, in northern Scotland, so I'm kind of wondering how many there were to begin with. Anyway, back to the story. St. Columkill dies in 597, and it's thought the Book of Kells might have been started in honor of the 200th anniversary of his death, and it was started on Iona. Notice I said it was started there. Because it's right around this time there were these pesky mustachioed fellows roaming the seas, popping onto shore, and raping and pillaging for treasure. The monks of Iona either got some warning the Vikings were coming or just managed a lucky escape before the Vikings got to their treasure. Because they sent a handful of their brothers in a small boat with the relics of St. Columkill and the illuminated manuscript they'd begun. A few relics were lost, but the boat and the book eventually made it to the Abbey of Kells in Ireland. And it's in Kells where the book is finished, and that's why it's known as the Book of Kells. So fast forward another couple hundred-ish years, and for the first time, the book is mentioned in the Annals of Ulster. It's the 11th century, and the reason it got noted is because it got stolen. Yeah, you know someone got in trouble for that one. So why would someone steal a book, especially in a time when so many people were completely illiterate? It's because these illuminated manuscripts weren't sitting around for people to thumb through. They were generally part of religious ceremonies and were kept in fancy schmancy cases in or near the high altar. And the Book of Kells's case was made of gold. And that case of gold was what the thieves were after, which is a lucky thing because it appears they took the case, then discarded the book, which was found, and I don't know exactly how long after, it was found buried in the dirt with its case missing. This did do some damage to the book, including losing several pages, but for the thing to have survived at all is just crazy lucky. Okay, so... Big history jump again, this time to 1592, when Queen Elizabeth decides to build a university in Dublin. Then Lizzie dies, we go through a few kings, and then Oliver Cromwell goes right through the neck of Charles I. Cromwell then brings his forces to Ireland. And I won't go into all the history, but this guy had some serious anger issues. He ends up in Kells in 1653 or 54, and destroys most of the abbey the Book of Kells was kept in. And he also turns the church into a stable for his horses. This guy did not like religion, like any sort of fanciful religion. He wanted everything very dour and serious and, yeah, boring. Luckily, again, this is a very lucky book. The church folks had gotten the Book of Kells out of there before his arrival into the safety of Dublin Castle. And in 1661, Henry Jones who will later become the Bishop of Meath once Cromwell is taken care of and King Charles II is in power, he presents the Book of Kells to Trinity College, where it's found a happy home ever since. 
So let's take a little break from the Book of Kells's history and jump back over to the library's history. In 1712, the Library of Trinity College was begun. It would take 20 years before what is known as the Old Library or the Long Room would open. And it's not because they were being careful architects that this took so long. They actually ran out of money soon into the project. And in the end, building the library ended up costing £20,000, which is about £1.4 million today or around $2 million. The library ended up opening up in 1732 with 25,000 books to fill its shelves. Then in 1801, Trinity College was given the honor of being made a legal deposit, which means it receives one copy of every book published in Ireland and the UK. And if that sounds familiar, the British Library, which I talked about way back in episode 7, is also a legal deposit. So this whole legal deposit thing, it's great, right? It establishes the library really is legit. Well, the problem was the library wasn't built for all the books that were now flooding in. See, the original library was built with kind of a flat-ish roof and with bookcases all along its length and its walls. Well, the weight of all those books coming in, it basically started pushing the walls of the library outward and the ceiling was about to collapse. Thankfully, some smarty pants came in and by 1861 had redesigned the old library to have an upper gallery and a weight-bearing vaulted ceiling, making it look like, as some people say, a cathedral of books. And today, while also being a tourist attraction, the Trinity College Library is a working library and it's where people can go to do research and study the, you know, the collection of books that they've amassed and and within the long room itself, which is the uh, the portion of the library you'd be most familiar with from pictures if you you know looked up Trinity College Library, there's 200,000 of the library's oldest books. There's also marble busts of famous authors and other literary sorts. Uh, there's a Celtic harp that was supposed to have belonged to Brian Boru. It didn't. And they also have one of the few remaining copies of this 1916 Easter proclamation that insisted on Ireland's independence from the UK. And before we start wrapping this up, just another little quickie for you numbers lovers. The long room, again, that's probably what you'll be most familiar with if you've seen pictures of the Trinity College Library. That room is 65 meters long, and that would be 215 feet for the non-metric people out there. So just really quickly back to the Book of Kells, right around the time the library was remodeled in the 1860s, this is also when the Book of Kells goes on display to the public for the first time. And that is actually one thing you will not see when you go to the long room. There's actually a full exhibit now for the Book of Kells and you enter and you see, you know, a a nice exhibition about the illuminated manuscripts, you know, just as a whole, just as a general concept. And then you go in and you can finally see the Book of Kells. And let me tell you, you need to be lucky on the day you go there because for the display of the book, they keep the book open in a case and it's laying flat. So you see two pages. And what they do is they turn these pages each day so, you know, the light doesn't damage the pigments or anything like that. And unfortunately, the day I was there, the page it was turned to was almost all text, and it really wasn't very impressive. The manuscripts at the Chester Beatty Museum, which I talked about in episode 11, were far more ooh and ah inspiring. And But, of course, I can't complain too much because I did get in for free, you know, because I know people. But if I had to pay the 15 euro or whatever it is to get in, I would have been annoyingly disappointed. But the long room itself was surprisingly more wow than I expected. So I guess that kind of balances it out a bit. Still, if we are ever allowed to travel again and you do get to Dublin and you do want to see gorgeous illuminated manuscripts, I'd say to visit the Chester Beatty first then do Trinity College Library if you have the time and money. Unless, of course, you 
you know people. There's also another way besides knowing people to get in for free, which I also did, but it's not exactly legal, so I am not going to tell you. Anyway, I think that is all I have for Trinity College Library and the Book of Kells. If you want to see some pages from the book and some images of the library, I'll put a link in the show notes for the Trinity College Library website. They also have a couple virtual exhibitions on there that are a really great way to procrastinate for a bit. And now it's the time for the updates. The podcast is plugging along, as you can hear. The show is nearly a year old, which means I need to start making some decisions. The website and domain name for the Book Out podcast will expire in one more year, so as 2021 progresses, I'll need to ponder over whether to keep the show running or to turn off the mic on this little project. This show does take a long time to put together, and I'm not sure what exactly I'm getting from it. I, I think I have like two listeners at this point, but thank you for listening. As for writing, I think I'm done with The Uncanny Raven Winston, which is book two of the Cassie Black trilogy. Yeah, that is a big hoorah. It is on pre-order and comes out on the 13th of April, and I'll be sending it to my review team soon to see what they think. And I have to say, this was a really fun book to write because mm, a, quite a bit of it takes place in London. And so it was a great way to travel to one of my favorite cities during lockdown. And book three, which is The Untangled Cassie Black, just needs a couple more read-throughs. That one is, of course, also on pre-order, and it comes out on the 18th of May. And it is going to feel a little weird to have this trilogy done and dusted when, you know, mid-May comes around. Okay, my book-loving friends, that is it. If you enjoyed the show, you can either show your support by purchasing one of my books, and yeah, the link is in the show notes, or by simply telling one other person about the show. And with that, I will hoot at you next time. The Book Owl Podcast is a production of Daisy Dog Media, copyright 2021, all rights reserved. The theme music was composed by Kevin McLeod. Audio processing by ophonic.com. Video creation by headliner.app. <laughs>